My name is Brett Walker. I am a researcher uh, with Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the avian research section. I mostly work on sage grouse, but this summer I've been working on a uh, research project on the Brewer Sparrow, which is a migratory songbird here in Colorado. Most of the Brewer Sparrows we have in Colorado occur in sagebrush, but there are a handful of records of Brewer Sparrows uh, in alpine areas above 12,000 feet. And we don't know which subspecies they are. So the goal of this research is to figure out which subspecies uh, a brewer sparrow occurs uh, in the high country of, of Colorado. Uh, if it's the timberline subspecies further north, basically undiscovered populations, or sagebrush birds that are starting out breeding down low in sagebrush and then moving upslope later in the season, or a third subspecies. So what we're doing is we're comparing the sagebrush birds in Colorado against alpine birds in Colorado uh, to look for differences in their acoustic structure of their songs, so what, the, what their songs sound like, their coloration of their plumage, so their feathers, their body size and shape, also morphology, uh, as well as their genetics or their DNA. And that's probably the most important is figuring out which, to figure out which subspecies, all of those things typically in birds have to line up. So at any given site, either in sagebrush or in the alpine, we'll start out by searching for territorial males, which we locate by their songs. One of the key features to distinguish subspecies of brewer sparrows is the structure of their songs. So we'll go out and we'll record different males' songs and then we'll be able to compare them between alpine areas and sagebrush areas uh, and see how they compare with previous recordings of the different subspecies. Brewer sparrows have two different types of songs that they give. Short songs, which are given by unpaired males. They sing over and over and over. And each short song of each male is individually distinctive. So you can actually recognize individual males just by their short song. Males also give long songs, um, which is typically in aggressive interactions. So to take measurements on a bird um, and to collect the genetic samples, so blood and feather samples, we have to first, first catch them. Fortunately, brewer sparrow males are very territorial, so we, what we'll do is we'll set up what's called a mist net. A mist net is a very fine mesh net that is essentially see-through um, and the birds can't see it. We set up speakers on either side of the net to play back those territorial male songs and that brings in the, the male thinking he has to defend his territory from some other bird. So he'll come in, hit the net, and we immediately extract them, hold them in a bird bag, and then we process the birds. We will weigh the birds, put bands on them, double check and make sure we have the right age and sex, um, take our measurements, take photos uh, of the birds against a color standard, uh, gotcha. and then uh, probably most, most importantly for the genetics is we have to take feather samples. So we take two feather samples from the tail and then we'll take a very small blood sample from the underside of the wing to get the genetic data, basically the DNA that's gonna tell us which subspecies these are, or if they're a different subspecies altogether that we didn't know about. Obviously the uh, health and condition of each one of these individual birds uh, is a high priority for us. So um, we take a number of different steps to ensure that the handling time is as short as possible and that we minimize the amount of stress on the bird. Once we've collected the data um, and gotten our, the samples we need, the bird is then released back into the wild. So it's, a, it's a right, right from where we catch it, essentially, it's going back uh, to, right onto its territory. Colorado has some of the most iconic big game species um, and alpine landscapes in the world, but Part of our job at CPW is to know which wildlife species we have here, where they occur, and how the populations are doing. So the first step in that is figuring out what we have. And 
For brewer sparrows in alpine areas, we don't yet know what we have. We won't know the results of the study until we get the genetic data back and the acoustic data analyzed. So it'll be several months before we know the final answer, but it's really exciting to uh, finally get a chance to resolve what is basically a century-old question in Colorado ornithology. The first brewer sparrows in alpine habitats were actually described in 1910 on Mount Evans. There's a specimen collected then. And for the past 40 years, there's been speculation in the breeding bird atlases um, where nobody really knows what, this, what uh, subspecies these birds are up in the high country. Ursilium, which is that white stripe above his eye, and it contrasts a little bit with his white eye ring, and that's a, actually a good field mark for the timberline subspecies. I've been working in sagebrush systems for several decades and having a, what would otherwise be considered a sagebrush obligate bird like a brewer sparrow uh, occurring in alpine habitats, it's been really rewarding to come up to the high country and find these birds in a completely different habitat than you would, than you would expect them in. And to finally get some answers that people have been, the questions people have been asking for you know, 30 or 40 years.